Um, great. Okay, and I'll go to slideshow. Thank you very much, Dr. Matsemi, for giving us a talk. She's bravely, boldly, we're go going where very few comm serves go, giving us a presentation um, for our academic meeting this morning on constipation in children. Okay. I'm going to ask everybody else, please just mute yourselves just so that she can start. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Matsemi, and I'll be presenting constipation in children. Um, so constipation is a disorder in which a child passes infrequent bowel movements, has painful defecation, or passes large caliber and hard stools that require excessive straining. It can be acute or chronic, and we usually consider it um, acute if symptoms have been present for eight weeks or less, and then chronic if constipation has been present for more than three months. It can be functional or organic. Um, functional meaning that there's difficulty passing stool or infrequent um, defecation or incomplete defecation without evidence of a primary anatomic or a neurological cause. The diagnosis is usually made clinically. Then um, um, the average um, number of times a child should pass stools varies a lot between children, but what has been determined as the mean is for children aged between zero and three months, we expect them to pass um, at least three stools a day or anything between five and 40 stools per week. And then for children three years and older, we at least expect them to pass one stool a day or three to 14 stools per week. When diagnosing functional constipation, we can use the Rome 4 criteria, um, which basically states that um, there should be two symptoms present for at least one month for infants and toddlers up to four years of age, symptoms being two or fewer defecations per week, history of excessive stool retention, history of painful or hard bowel movements, history of large diameter stools, presence of a large fecal mass in the rectum. And if the child is toilet trained, there should be at least one episode per week of incontinence. And then also history of large diameter stools that may obstruct the toilet. And then for children and adolescents um, age four and less, um, it's pretty much the same. Um, two, at least two of the following symptoms, once a week for at least a month two or few defecations in the toilet per week, at least one episode of fecal incontinence per week, history of retentive posturing or excessive volitional stool retention, and then history of painful or hard bowel movements, presence of large fecal mass in the rectum, and history of large diameter stools that may obstruct the toilet. And then also if the symptoms cannot be adequately explained by another medical condition. Sorry, Siri is recording me. Okay. Sorry. Um, and then the causes of constipation can be divided into functional and organic. For functional, there are certain mechanisms involved. Um, decrease in propulsive force in the colon and the rectum. Um, if there is impaired rectal sensation, if there is a functional outlet obstruction, and also if there's behavioral withholding. So some of the reasons why a child may withhold stool is if um, there's painful defecation, for example, with anal fissures, um, hemorrhoids, and even sometimes sexual abuse. If there's been a change of environment or change in the child's routine, if there are psychosocial stresses, um, some emotional disturbances, and also if there are some cognitive problems. Then looking at the organic causes for constipation, um, these will include abnormalities of the colon and rectum, for example, if there is um, anal stenosis, if there are spinal cord lesions like spina bifida, there are neuropathic lesions like Hirschsprung's disease, which is basically um, a motor disorder of the gut caused by failure of neural crest cells 
to migrate completely. So the colon is then aganglionic. If um, there's also metabolic causes like hypothyroidism and hypohypokalemia and um, hypohypocalcemia. And a lot of drugs also have constipation as a side effect. Then um, it is also possible for a child with constipation to have um, encopresis. And how this happens is when a child withholds stool, um, their stool retention, the rectum will accommodate. Then eventually that rectum will become atonic or desensitized, meaning there will be larger stools um, accumulating in the rectum. The rectum will then further dilate and this will cause the anal canal to shorten. So with the shortened um, anal canal, stool can easily escape and the child will end up swelling or staining themselves. Then with presentation um, on history, we need to find out um, the duration of the symptoms, the duration of the constipation, the stool frequency and consistency. And we can use the Bristol stool chart for this. So this is what it looks like. And it helps when um, you can show it to the parent or the child so that they can adequately describe to you the type of stools that they're passing. We have type one all the way through to type seven. And then um, you need to ask if there's any blood on wiping. Um, is there any mucus in the stool? Is there painful um, defecation? Or are they hesitant and reluctant or frightened um, whenever they have to go to the bathroom? You also need to ask about withholding behaviors or toilet refusal. Also ask about previous medi medications that they've tried and whether or not they've been effective, find out about feeding history um, and also dietary history. Um, um, we also need to ask about soiling or even urinary incontinence because this can signal um, a neurological cause for the constipation. And then also family history um, of conditions like celiac disease and hypothyroidism. Then on physical examination, obviously you'd have to examine the child systemically from head to toe, do the anthropometry, um, check their growth. If there's failure to thrive, examine the back, look for neurological conditions like cerebral palsy. But when it comes to the abdomen, we'll look for tenderness, for distension, for fecal loading. Um, if you can palpate a mass, that's probably like a palpable that's um, feces in the left lower quadrant. And then also examine the perineum, look um, at the position of the anus, look at um, the skin around the anus, are there any fissures, skin tags, are there any hemorrhoids, and also check the anal tone. And then when you take history and when you examine the child, you need to look for red flags as well. Um, these include um, a baby who's less than six weeks of age. If there's been delayed passage of uh, meconium, children should pass, I mean, babies should pass meconium usually within the first 24 to 48 hours. Um, if they are ribbon-like stools, which could indicate an anorectal malformation. If there's weight loss or poor growth, if there's persistent vomiting, fever, anorexia, weight loss, and diarrhea, bloody diarrhea. Um, if there's an abdominal mass that's not consistent with the fecal mass, um, and then also if there's an abnormal perineal, um, perineal exam, meaning abnormal tone or absence of um, anal wink, or if there's um, a sacral tuft of hair at the back. And then other signs is just a table showing other alarming signs. Um, this can include severe, exa another example is um, severe abdominal distension, which could signal, indicate Hirschsprung's disease in a child in an infant, and also functional um, ileus if the child is very, very sick. And then if there's delayed growth, um, we need to look for systemic causes, example, um, hypothyroidism. 
Then investigations, like I said, this is a clinical diagnosis, so investigations are not routinely required. But um, if you want to assess the extent of um, the fecal impaction, or you want to look for um, an organic cause of the constipation, um, can send the child for abdominal x-rays, an ultrasound can be done, blood tests can be done if there's maybe um, systemic causes like hypothyroidism, so function, thyroid function tests and um, electrolytes like CMP can be done. And then we can also uh, test for celiac disease if there's family history. Um, I think in tertiary facilities or higher units, barium enemas can be done if there's suspicion of um, anatomical causes, erectile biopsy, anal sphincter electromyography, which will show um, if there's failure of relaxation of the internal sphincter. And then there's also something called um, a SIDS marker study. So it's usually used if there's a patient, if you have a patient who's suffering from chronic constipation, it's a colon transit study that uses these tiny markers to estimate how fast or slow food or stools are traveling through the colon. So um, it's a capsule that will be given to a child on day one, and then on day five, x-rays will be done. So if there's passage of 80% of those markers, we know then that there's normal um, transit in the colon or motility. And then if those markers are scattered throughout the colon, um, it will usually signal colonic inertia. And then if they are accumulated or clustered in the rectum, then we know there's probably a outlet um, obstruction or dysfunction. And after having done the taking history and having done the examination, there's nothing that's consistent with an organic cause. Um, functional constipation can be diagnosed. And then with management, management can be pharmacological or non-pharmacological. I'll start with non-pharmacological. We need to first start by educating parents and caregivers on behavioral modification and also dietary mod modification. And we also need to intervene promptly to prevent the cycle of stool withholding that can lead um, to a worsen recurrent chronic constipation. So with behavior modification, um, positioning, um, we need to look at how the child sits on the toilet seat. So um, the proper way is for a child to have a footstool to ensure that the knees are higher than the hips and the child should lean forward and put their elbows on their knees. And then we can also place a toilet ring over the toilet seat if it's needed. So this is what it should look like. And then we can also train the child to do toilet sits up to five minutes, three times a day, preferably after meals. And then we can also do positive reinforcement with star charts or a diary. Then with dietary modification, um, we can advise the parent or the caregiver to increase um, fiber intake of the child. So for infants and children younger than two, a reasonable goal for fiber intake is approximately five grams per day. So we can do this by um, giving the child vegetables, fruits, and fiber-containing cereals for infants and children. And then there's also no need to increase fluid intake beyond um, the daily um, maintenance fluid requirements for the child. Then pharmacological. Um, this includes disimpaction, which can be done with drugs or it can be done manually. And then we also have laxative therapy. Disimpaction just means um, clearing or removing the stool that has been retained um, in the rectum. And we can do it orally via nasal gastric tube or even rectally. It can be done inpatient and outpatient. So the oral route, um, it's preferred because it's non-invasive. But there are issues with compliance, especially if, if it's done, it's been done at home. What we give is polyethylene glycol, um, uh, which is basically bowel prep. And then we'll say that there's been adequate disinfection if what we're giving the child, the solution that we're giving the child, 
and the output, the stools are the same in color. And then if it's disimpaction that's done at home, we will say it's successful if um, there's empty, there's an either an empty or a small amount of stool um, on rectal examination. And there's also resolution of the mass that was there um, in the left lower quadrant if there was fecal impaction. And then this is a table just showing um, how we would give the sachets if they're doing disimpaction at home. And this is the drug that can be used, Marvicol, I mean, the sachet that can be used. And then the rectal root or an enema, it's faster. It's usually done inpatient, um, but it's very invasive and it's likely to add or contribute to the discomfort the child already has um, in relation to defecation. But if um, polyethylene glycol is not available, then an enema can be used. Then with pharmacological maintenance uh, therapy, we use laxatives. Laxatives can be os osmotic or it can be a lubricant or it can be um, a stimulant. Osmotic agents include lactulose and polyethylene, polyethylene glycol. And stimulants examples are um, Senna. So these are examples of the drugs of the medication that can be given. And these drugs are usually schedule zero. So they can be, um, the parent can get them over the counter also at a pharmacy. Um, glycerin suppositories is the one that we have. So um, um, one suppository up to a one and a half suppository can be given as a single dose daily as required. And one suppository contains about 1.26 grams of glycerin. And then it also has a, a liquid um, form. Glycerin also can come in a liquid form. And then this is an example on the left of a polyethylene glycol. And then Senacot is also an example of um, a Sena, which is a stimulant. And then just to summarize, um, in this table, uh, this flow diagram, after having done history and physical examination, if you assess the child as having functional constipation, <clears throat> you need to assess whether there's fecal impaction. If there is, um, you need to perform disimpaction for the child and follow it up with maintenance therapy. If that's not effective, you're going to reassess the child and maybe try a different medication. If that's still not effective, then you need to probably look for an organic cause, do blood tests and rule out things like um, Hirschsprung's disease. If there's no fecal impaction, you can just start the child on maintenance therapy. If that is effective, um, you can slowly wean them and observe. And um, yeah, that is it. Thank you Thanks. very much, that's all. I think it's a it's an awkward topic <laughs> that nobody wants to talk about. It's but it is a pressing topic in a peds ed. Um, are there any questions or any comments? Hello, it's me. Hello. Um, hey. I don't have a question. Just a <laughs> slight addition. Um, when you're counselling the parents, when you're giving the, for example, the polyethylene glycol or whatever we're giving them. Just um, counsel them on the fact that it's it, it's going to take time for the situation to actually resolve completely. And maintenance, if I'm not mistaken, I think is usually at least two to six weeks that they need to continue the maintenance for. And then also when they're giving the poly polyethylene glycol, um, the only way it actually works is if you drink lots of water. So if you just take it and you, you don't add to the water content, it'll also, it won't be as effective as it should have been because it absorbs water to help get things moving. So just encourage them to actually drink more water. Um, and then- one, one, another... one comment on that, Di, before you move on to the next comment. Very often, if you are using polyethylene glycol, so the Go Lightly or Movicol or whatever, bowel prep essentially is being used it will depend on the duration of the symptoms as to how long you're going to use it for and mm. it will also depend on the severity of the constipation for how long you'll use it for it also has to go hand in hand with um, bowel training again retraining 
but more than just water, very often they'll prescribe oral rehydration sachets. So because you when you when you lose a, a large volume of um, fluid um, in when you're using these um, these preparations, you can also lose a lot of electrolytes. So with water, with uh, with oral rehydration mm -hmm. sachets at the same time. Yeah, that actually makes perfect okay. sense. And then just one other additional, when you were saying for um, kind of behavioral things, uh, sometimes if kids are changing schools and stuff and maybe they don't want to go to the toilet at school also can cause them to be having um, conservation. Just, just dig a little bit deeper and just try, like just to try and encourage um, with, with that whole change of environment situation. Yep, but thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kotatsu. You are very brave. I'm I'm so proud of our, our ComServes giving talks. Are there any other um, questions or comments from anybody who's joined us? Kotatsu is going to save her talk as a PDF and she's going to uh, also share it with us. Um, I'm going to ask you can stop recording now, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Matsemi. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.